I want to play a game with you guys. I'm going to give you a bunch of clues, and I want you to guess which video game developer I'm thinking of. Now, once you have your answer, go ahead and shout it out as loudly as you can at your monitor or cell phone. Okay? Deal? All right. Clue number one. Video game developer that got his start as an illustrator. Clue number two. Went on to work for Capcom to create some of the most famous and profitable franchises for the company. Clue three. Rose through the ranks of Capcom to become a powerful executive. And our final clue, this person famously quit Capcom after years of making sequel after derivative sequel and overall becoming frustrated with how things were going. This person famously quit the company to go form his own independent video game studio. Do you know who I'm talking about? No, not Keiji and Afune, but thanks for yelling. I've got one more clue that might help you. After leaving Capcom, this person made a cell phone game that pulled in billions of dollars, making his game more profitable than Pokemon Go and Candy Crush combined. That doesn't sound like KG, does it? Ladies and gentlemen, this person I'm going to present to you is an absolute rock star in the Japanese gaming industry. He went from rags to riches, back to rags, and then finally skyrocketed back up into untold riches. This is one of the funniest, most candid developers that I've ever read about. He has brought me some of my most favorite video games and some of yours, and you've probably never heard of him. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Yoshiki Okamoto. Yoshiki Okamoto can best be described as a visionary, a maverick, a womanizer, a comedian, a billionaire. This guy has brought us some of the most famous franchises to have ever existed. Street Fighter 2, Final Fight. He was behind Capcom's Golden Era, Onimusha, Resident Evil, Monster Hunter. The list goes on. This guy had a hand in it. All. I just can't believe this guy's career. It's so fascinating. And the deeper I dug, the more hilarious and interesting stuff I found out about him. So I've broken his life up into five different eras to share with you. The Konami era, the Capcom era, the post-Capcom era, slash Games Republic era, the broke and out of money era, and the present day era. It's a wild fucking ride. Get ready. Like most great stories, it all starts with a woman. Yoshiki Okamoto had just graduated college and he was looking for a job. He had found one, but the problem was it was in a different city from where his wife lived. And for a while they had a long distance relationship until she dropped the ultimatum on him. Either find a job in my city or we're getting divorced. Not wanting to be alone for the rest of his life, Yoshiki moved to his wife's city and looked in the papers and found a job as an illustrator for Konami. Yoshiki's first job in the video games industry was as a poster designer for Konami. And the first game that he designed a poster for was a game called Tutankhamen. <laughs> I found two different posters that could have been Yoshiki's, but I haven't been able to confirm it. There's this one, and then what I believe to be Yoshiki's, this one. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> now, Yoshiki was completely content with making posters for the rest of his career at Konami. That is until one day when his boss came up to him and said, Yoshiki, I want you to make a game about driving. And Okamoto, he didn't want to make a driving game. For one, he was hired to be an illustrator. And for two, he thought driving games were boring. So in secret, 
he began developing a shoot 'em up game, starring a pilot that would travel through time, there's just different eras of time, and shoot down different kinds of B 52 bombers and space age jets and UFOs, something that sounded very exciting to him. In secret, he would hand off the code for the shoot 'em up game. And when his boss would come around, he would show him a really crappy driving game. Like he just built this temporary driving game as a ruse to, to trick his manager. When the time came to show off the final product, what Okamoto showed off was a game he had come up with called Time Pilot. Now, Time Pilot was an office favorite. Everyone loved to play it, and the big bosses at Konami thought it was going to be a hit. So once they put it out in the arcades, surprisingly, it was a massive hit. It became one of the most famous and profitable shoot 'em ups at the time. But there was one problem. Okamoto's boss had asked him to make a driving game. How do you think the follow-up conversation went? My boss was talking to the president and called me to come over to them. He was telling the president that my game was successful because of the instructions he gave me. He hadn't done a thing. I heard that and I wanted to kill the guy. Instead, I agreed with my boss so he would not be disgraced. This boss was a lucky guy. At that point forward, Okamoto rose to the ranks of celebrity within Konami, and instead of being restricted to make just driving games, he had complete creative freedom to make whatever he wanted. So he began work on his next project, another shoot 'em up that takes place in space called Gyrus, a game I'm very familiar with because it's really fun. I played it on NES all the time. It's you're like a little space fighter and you go around in a gyroscopic motion. <laughs> Now, Gyrus wasn't as big of a smash hit as Time Pilot because the arcade scene was kind of drying up at the time. It was oversaturated by a million different other coin-op games and the home console market was just starting in Japan. So while it was a fan favorite and is one of the legacy titles within Konami to this day, it didn't pull in as much money. Despite this, Okamoto felt he deserved a raise. Guys, let this next story serve as a warning for anyone out there who wants to work with Konami. There are two things you need to know here. One, never, never ever ask Konami for a raise. Two, never issue Konami an ultimatum that you will quit if you don't get that raise. If we know anything, that shit don't fly with Konami. I asked for a raise, and they said they would give me a really small raise, but I wanted a little more, so I said I would quit. The next day, when I came to work, they fired me. Shortly after being fired from Konami, Okamoto's wife left him, and I just want to bring this up. Okamoto's ex-wife is a prominent figure in Okamoto's life. He spares no opportunity to bring her up, especially when it's unprompted and awkward. He'll just bring up his ex-wife in a conversation. When I was reading an interview with Okamoto, he was it was between one up and Okamoto. One of the journalists had mentioned that he had learned Japanese so he could propose to his Japanese girlfriend. And Okamoto took this opportunity to warn the journalist and provide one of the best quotes of this video. I had a Japanese wife once too, but we got divorced. After you get married, they change into another person entirely. Like, if you were looking at them through a scouter in Dragon Ball, you would see their power level start to skyrocket. Beep, 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 Then it breaks. That's what happened to my ex-wife, like Frieza. I fucking love Okamoto. <laughs> Okamoto had now lost a dream job, he lost his wife, and he could not find work as an illustrator. But he put a CV out there, and eventually Capcom responded. And he wanted to work at Capcom because the president had personally come up to him and said, hey, we're a small company right now, but 
With the way things are going to go, we're going to be one of the biggest companies out there. And Okamoto was excited by this prospect and signed on. During his early tenure at Capcom, Okamoto developed two of the most prolific shooters in Capcom's history. 1942 and Gunsmoke. Excuse me, Gun. Dot smoke. Now, Okamoto started developing follow-ups to 1942 with 1943. He created a couple other minor hits in there, but nothing was as famous as 1942 or Gunsmoke. And he just could not think of a great game idea until one day when he stumbled into an arcade and saw Double Dragon 2. And he thought the game was badass. He loved the side-scrolling beat-em-up feature. He liked the, the themes of gangs and big muscly men. But he thought to himself, I could do this better. And so he did. In a case of deja vu, Okamoto's boss at Capcom had come to him and said, I want you to make a sequel to Street Fighter. But Okamoto didn't want to make a sequel to Street Fighter. He wanted to make a sequel to Double Dragon. But the thing is, Capcom didn't own the rights to Double Dragon, so Okamoto decided to make a game which he would try and pass off as a sequel to Street Fighter. A game called Final Fight. Now if you didn't know this, Final Fight's original title was Street Fighter 89. In fact, it even went to a trade show back in the day with the name Street Fighter 89. But once all the executives took a look at Final Fight and noticed that it was a complete deviation from a, a 1v1 fighting game, they're like, give it a different name. And then so it became Final Fight. He released it. It became a massive success overnight. And Okamoto began his celebrity again at Capcom. Capcom was in trouble at the time. If Final Fight didn't sell well, Capcom might have been in danger of going under. But it actually sold more than Capcom executives expected it to. So after it took off, they told me to create Final Fight 2. I'm not the type of person to do what I'm told though. So I said, well, I don't want to do that. And then I decided to make Street Fighter Two. Oh yes, once again, our boy got told by the executives, hey, you made something great, make a sequel to that game. No, I'm not going to do that. I actually now want to make a sequel to Street Fighter. I hope you're beginning to notice a trend here. Okamoto never went the way the big bosses told him to go. He spat in their faces for the most part. He always gave his opinion no matter what, even if it would offend everyone in the room. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Okamoto was the idea he had for the character of Chun-Li in Street Fighter 2. So Okamoto is at a meeting with all the developers of Street Fighter 2 and they were talking about a uh, balance within the game and, and they were talking about the different characters and what they had to offer. And Okamoto pipes up with his own opinion. You know how each character has a life bar? At one point, I wanted to make a power gauge for Chun-Li shorter than for other characters because women are not as strong. But another designer didn't want to do that. We both had legitimate reasons. But then we came to an agreement not to make it shorter. I know that's going to rustle a lot of jimmies out there, but I fucking respect him for being bold enough to even <laughs> mention that. Oh, could you imagine? Yoshiki had some sort of reputation in Capcom for being a womanizer. And... In my research, I came across one of the funniest rumors I had ever heard. According to some former Capcom employees, at one point in time, Okamoto was caught on company grounds getting a blowjob from a woman dressed in a Chun-Li cosplay. <laughs> and unfortunately, this rumor is false. And you want to know how I know? Because Okamoto denied it. And if it were true, I know 100% that Okamoto would wear that shit on his sleeve. But that's not the only thing. This next story is true. You see, Okamoto was kind of a party guy. He liked to go out and get drunk and take Western business partners with him to strip clubs. And what he would do is he would pay the strippers to shout, vagina at the Western business partners in Japanese. In return, 
he would trick the Western business partners to yell back at the strippers, I want to fuck you from behind. <laughs> he would just feed them different dirty shit for them to say to these strippers all the time. And when somebody asked Okamoto if this story was true, he replied with, I'm not right in the head. It was around in 1997 when Okamoto founded his own subsidiary of Capcom called Flagship, and their focus was on writing scenarios or organizing the story plot points, setting up things like sequels or spin-offs. He wrote scenarios for Resident Evil, the Dino Crisis series, and then when uh, Capcom approached Nintendo to work on a partnership, he headed up projects like Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons, and the Minish Cap. Uh, I believe the last game that they worked on was Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. During his time as the president of Flagship, Okamoto was fixated on one idea that he wanted to come to fruition. He had an idea for a Resident Evil style game set in the Sengoku period. The working title was Biohazard Sengoku. Instead of having police officers and zombies, he would replace it with samurais and demons. They made a prototype for that game and it ended up becoming Onimusha, one of my favorite Capcom franchises. Now keep this in mind, it was Okamoto that created the concept for Onimusha. During this, Okamoto was kind of in charge of where the storylines were going in all of Capcom's respective properties. Uh, he had so much influence that he met with George Romero, the creator of Night of the Living Dead, who had come to Capcom with a script for Resident Evil. And George Romero had directed a Resident Evil 2 commercial at the time, so they thought he would be a natural fit. Okamoto didn't seem to think so. His script wasn't good, so Romero was fired. I fucking love the balls on this guy. He goes up to George Romero, the creator of the zombie genre, the one person that Resident Evil owes its entire franchise to, and tells him, your script's not that good, buddy. Sorry, you're canned. Regardless of the quality of the Paul W.S. Anderson Resident Evil movie franchise, it's one of the most profitable movie franchises of all time. Okamoto was right. I guess George Romero's script sucked. Now you would think after years of success and becoming one of the most respected people in Capcom and having a lot of creative control over some of the most famous franchises to this very date, that Okamoto would be happy. Oh no. Around 2003, Okamoto started to notice the writing on the wall. Capcom was focused on creating sequel after sequel to games like Resident Evil, oh, let's make seven spin-offs and Resident Evil 4 and then five and movies and movies. Uh, sequels to Onimusha, sequels to Mega Man. He had gotten sick of making sequels. He wanted to make new games, but he found that every time he would propose a new game idea, Capcom would return to him and say, uh, yeah, that idea sounds great, but let's attach it to this franchise. It got to the point where Okamoto wanted to quit. When I decided I was going to quit, it was with absolute certainty. I drank so much one night that I don't even remember what happened exactly, but my decision was made. I was carried to my bed with my clothes still on. The reason I did that is because it was almost like dying. That's how difficult it was for me and how strong I felt about it. I wanted to die and then be reborn. After I made my decision to leave Capcom, I went to the president and kept asking, let let me quit. Let me quit. But he said, no, you have to think about it some more. You can't leave. He even offered a huge boost in my salary, so I wouldn't go to another company. And that was way more than any other employee in the company was getting. It was probably the most amount of money that he could technically even offer. At that point, I didn't want to embarrass him, so I asked to think about it. But of course, my decision wasn't influenced at all. So after a while, I returned to him and said, I've thought about it, but I can't accept this raise. I have to quit and start my own thing. That's how I left Capcom. So just a quick recap of history. Okamoto goes to Konami. Please give me a raise, otherwise I'll quit. Konami, 
Fuck you, you're fired. Flash forward 20 years, Okamoto goes to Capcom. I wanna quit. Capcom's like, here's the most amount of money we can possibly offer you. Okamoto's like, no, I, I still wanna quit. And he quits. In 2003, Okamoto finally quit Capcom, and it was a big deal because nobody had ever done something like that. Nobody had been so powerful and made so much money and had such a high pedigree in a corporation like Capcom and then just up and quits to form their own indie game studio. Back in 2003, indie game studios weren't a thing. And Okamoto bought a little apartment and formed Game Republic, which was comprised of about 18 members. And it was a tight knit development company. It was very intimate. Everyone liked each other. They would get drunk after after hours and at 2 a.m. go fishing together. It was a nice, peaceful little company. Now, in the beginning, Okamoto struck a deal with Sony to create a first party game called Genji, which has been accused of being an Onimusha clone, even though it's more like a Devil May Cry blend with Onimusha 2, but regardless, Okamoto created Onimusha, so if he wants to go out there and make his own vision of Onimusha come true, who's to stop him? So of course, our dear old friend Keiji Inafune had an opinion that he shared with 1up.com. Okay, a couple of quick ones. Onimusha, what's going on with that? And how do you feel about Genji, the Onimusha ripoff made by former Capcom employee Yoshiki Okamoto's Game Republic? First of all, please don't group Onimusha and that Genji game together. Personally, I'd wonder about someone who says, I don't want to make an Onimusha sequel, and then leaves the company and goes off and makes a ripoff of Onimusha. Oh, you heard that correctly. Keiji Inafune went out there and criticized someone for leaving Capcom to go fully independent and create a game that was similar to a previous game they had created at Capcom. Well, I guess time makes hypocrites of us all. Or I guess you could say, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Number nine. Ya bitch. Now, instead of attacking Keiji and Afune, Okamoto always took the high ground, and he defended his position and he defended Genji. If you've actually played Genji, it's not an Onimusha clone. Sure, if you look at screenshots, it may seem like Onimusha because of the atmosphere and since the character has a sword, but the similarities really in there. I didn't think Inafune would look at it like that, and I'm a little bitter because of it. I don't want people to think that I set out to create an Onimusha ripoff or anything like what I did for Capcom. I've been trying to stay away from all that stuff. And if you look at Okamoto's track record, he did start to make more original franchises. Yes, he made another Genji sequel for the PlayStation 3, but his reasoning was thus. Uh, anytime a console releases, you definitely want to get on board because that's where the money's at. Meanwhile, he was also making deals with Microsoft for the Xbox 360 for two exclusive titles, one of which was a party game that failed to kind of capture an audience because after a while, Microsoft pulled all their funding from most of their Japanese exclusive titles. But it was during this time that Okamoto made one of my personal favorite games of all time, folklore for the PS3, and that was possibly the most original game he had ever developed. And if you want to know more about that game, you can check out my review. One really interesting coincidence during this time in Okamoto's life was the apartment that he rented for Game Republic to operate out of was located right next door to another company called Dimps. And Dimps were responsible for bringing all the Dragon Ball Z Budokai games out for the PlayStation 2. And Okamoto, of course, was a humongous Dragon Ball fan. And the president of Dimps also used to work at Capcom. So they became best friends by proximity. And later on, because of this relationship, uh, Game Republic and Dimps formed a business venture to release some Dragon Ball DS games, and Okamoto's dream of making a Dragon Ball game 
came true. In my research, I've kind of found out a little bit more about the relationship between Okamoto and the president of Dimps. He kind of spilled the beans on some shit he shouldn't have done. And I'll just let this next part speak for itself. The president of Dimps lives in the same apartment complex as you. Do you guys ever talk? And who else from the industry do you hang out with? He actually lives in the same building, on the same floor, right next door to me. Mr. Nishiyama used to work at Capcom as well, so we bonded over the hard work we shared there, and we've been good friends ever since. Both of us had long stretches where we weren't in a relationship, but he would always be sharing a room with some guy. Not me, I mean we were friends, just friends. I'm pretty sure Mr. Nishiyama is bisexual, but I'm straight. I only like girls, but he likes both. Mr. Nishiyama taught me how to turn my ideas into game design documents, but he didn't teach me about men. <laughs> So, for no reason whatsoever, during an interview, Okamoto outs the president of Dimps. But 1UP decided to take this opportunity to press Okamoto even further about his sexuality. That's interesting because I don't know who said it, but a long time ago, at least six or seven years ago, and it might have been from either the editorial side or the development side, but someone told me that you were gay. To which Okamoto replied, No way! I'm straight! I think it's just a misunderstanding. I might have said I was working on the Game Boy, and they heard gay boy. <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> I've never, I have never in my life heard a developer <laughs> just say, gay boy? No, no, they must have heard wrong. <laughs> I have never in my life heard a developer just be so candid <laughs> in an interview before. Oh wait, yes I have, because there's one more really crazy incident that Okamoto did during an interview. As I mentioned, Okamoto had a reputation for being a practical joker. He would spare no expense of his own reputation to do something that he thought would gain a lot of laughs. Let me introduce you to Toshihiro Nagoshi, the creator of the Monkey Ball and the Yakuza series. This is what he looks like. And no, that's not a fucking costume. It's a way of life. One thing you need to know about Toshihiro Nagoshi is he has a reputation for being cool and kind of a badass and very, very conservative. Toshihiro Nagoshi does not like jokes, especially jokes at his expense. For some reason or another, Okamoto was hired to interview Toshihira Nagoshi. And at one point in time, they had been friends, at least, you know, associates with the game industry. And, well, Okamoto thought it would be really, really funny if he showed up to the interview in cosplay. He went up to Nagoshi's handler and he said, hey, I'm gonna be dressing up for this interview in costume and I just want you to give Nagoshi a heads up. What he failed to mention was what he would be dressing up as. Okamoto had this perception of Nagoshi as being a badass who liked to tan himself and wear these bright silver suits. And Okamoto himself, being from Osaka, had a bit of a darker complexion, but he felt it wasn't dark enough to respect Nagoshi's complexion. So Okamoto shows up to the interview with Nagoshi entirely in blackface. <laughs> and believe me, I tried to find any photographic evidence I could of this encounter. I looked through every cached website, Wayback Machine, Famitsu article. I wanted a photograph of Okamoto in blackface embarrassing Toshihiro Nagoshi. And as far as I know, no photographic evidence of this encounter exists. So you might be wondering, what was Toshihira Nagoshi's reaction to this? According to Okamoto, Nagoshi said, What the fuck? 
I don't think he liked it very much at all. I mean, I had asked his handler ahead of time if I could cosplay, but oh well. Nagoshi-san said, I heard you were gonna cosplay, but I didn't know you were gonna do that. Oh well. I told him I was sorry about it and that it was probably inappropriate. <laughs> During Okamoto's time being independent at Game Republic, all of his games were well received critically, but they never reached the financial heights that he had seen at Capcom. His business was starting to lose money and he became desperate and when a company called Brash reached out to him with a licensed opportunity where they would fund his company to make a game based on Clash of the Titans, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll make a licensed game. Our studio will do the very best they can to make it an awesome game. And at the same time, they were working out other deals to make a game based on the 300 series. Uh, they had secured a deal for 301 that never came to be both the movie and, and the deal itself. But he thought this would be a great way to make some easy money because there was a movie coming out based on Clash of the Titans and if he could get that game out at the same time it was a guaranteed money maker. Well Brash went bankrupt and the funding for Clash of the Titans was gone and Okamoto had to scramble to continue development on that game because it was about 75% of the way done but nowhere near ready to be released. It cost him over $2 million for every single month that the game didn't release. And it's estimated that the game had five more months of development left, costing his business over $10 million in the hole for this Clash of the Titans game. Namco reached out to him and said, hey, you guys finished developing Clash of the Titans and we'll release it for you. And this became pretty much the death knell in Game Republic. Sure, he went on to make a couple of games for Namco, uh, one of the most famous of course being Majin in the Forsaken Kingdom. While it was a high quality original game, it released one month after another Namco game about action platforming with partners called Enslaved Odyssey to the West, and it basically diverted all the attention away from Majin in the Forsaken Kingdom, and it was a critical failure. His company was bleeding money. Knight's contract was rushed through development by Namco. It was unfinished. Nobody knew the game existed. Did you even know it existed? I didn't until I researched it. And that was pretty much the end of Game Republic. <laughs> Game Republic went from a company that housed 300 employees, that had made some solid deals that just kept falling through. They were in debt for over $10 million. And sometime between 2011 and 2012, the website for Game Republic went down and Okamoto disappeared off the face of the planet. There were rumors that Okamoto had made some shady deals with the Yakuza to fund some of his final games at Game Republic and that he was on the run from the Yakuza and he abandoned everyone he knew to disappear. Okamoto had a personal blog that he used to write in and update everyone about what was going on in his life for many years. and. He pulled that down from the internet, and the only evidence that it exists is through the Wayback Machine. There are a few entries that detailed some of the events going on in his life during his disappearance. And I'm going to paraphrase, using Google Translate, the highlights of what was going on during his disappearance, according to his blog. I lost my fucking job. I am living alone. I moved into a dingy ass basement apartment that roaches would be too embarrassed to infest. This fish I bought tasted like shit. Despite all this, life is pretty good. The only evidence I could find of Okamoto supporting himself during this time in his life came from a comment found on an article about the closure of Game Republic on Polygon. A commenter said, He was a teacher at HAL in Nagoya for a while, but he had a really bad reputation of showing up late, 
unprepared, and not teaching at all. He was promptly let go. Then I had a friend of mine who was working at Game Republic and left around August last year saying that many employees were apparently not getting paid on time and he wasn't sure if he was ever going to get paid. What a shame. Eventually, some journalists caught up with Okamoto and he released a public statement saying that, I'm retired from making console games. I'm, I'm sorry that Game Republic closed. It's technically not closed. I still own it. I'm the only current employee of Game Republic, but for the foreseeable future, I don't see myself continuing to make console games. In 2013, there was a social media service in Japan called Mixi, and Mixi is kind of like their equivalent of Facebook. And it was in a financial slump, and they wanted more users to come to the platform. They wanted something that was going to keep people there. So there was a guy who worked for Mixi called Koki Kimura who had known Okamoto and respected all of the franchises that he worked on. And he felt that Okamoto would make something great for the company. So he asked Okamoto to come over to Mixie and make a mobile phone game for them to bring more users to the platform. Okamoto thought this was a great idea because he personally believed that gaming consoles were on their way out and the mobile market was on the uprise. He had three conditions for Okamoto. One, the game had to be easy to control. Two, the game had to be easy to connect and play with other players in their vicinity. And three, the game had to have tension and excitement, much like Okamoto's previous games. So, Okamoto did what he did best. He put together a team, and what they came up with was a game called Monster Strike. Monster Strike went on to become the highest earning mobile phone application of its time. In 2018, the game earned over $7.8 billion. For perspective, that's more than Pokemon Go, that's more than Candy Crush, you name a mobile phone game, it tops it. It was an overnight success. Okamoto had both saved Mixie and his own life and reputation. Everyone else in the console gaming industry was eating a large slice of humble fucking pie. Keiji Inafune releases Mighty Number no. 9. It is a critical and commercial failure. His company is then absorbed by level 5. And Keiji is forced to then create a mobile phone game. And that game was called Dragons and Colonies. Ever heard of it? Hey KG, how's that pie taste? To close things out, Okamoto is one of those legendary people that defies all explanation. Uh, he shouldn't have been as successful as he was, and especially in the Japanese game industry when he defied all of his boss's orders to make what he wanted. When he struck out on his own and failed and then picked himself up and rose to a meteoric level. And throughout it all, he still refused to talk shit on all the people that talk shit on him. You might be asking, besides being a billionaire, what is he up to right now? Well, Okamoto has his own YouTube channel and I think his channel speaks for itself.
ょっと待ってねりょうちゃんこれね最初から入らないかも穴が開いててでも反対側にするとダメなんで Thank you very much.